God's love can't be contained by any building, by any location, by any thin place we have. This is dangerous preaching, sort of, I'm doing. Not entirely, but kind of. We love our buildings, and I want to be very, very clear with everyone here. I love our buildings, too. I love this building. It's beautiful. I love the rectory. It's beautiful. I love the buildings in Wyoming and Cincinnati and the historic place. I love, they're beautiful. They're great. And we need to take care of them, yes. Hear me say that. We need to take care of them. And God cannot be contained by any building. God could not be contained by any temple. Do you remember it wasn't that long ago when we couldn't gather here together in this church building? And I, I can get away with saying that now because it, it feels like it was just yesterday, at least in my mind's eye. And as much as I enjoy the people who, uh, Matt Glover and Rich Gomez and John Boss and, and others who were, were early, early adapters and helped me with the videography. I, was, I wasn't even preaching to the choir at that point. I was preaching to the organist. I was preaching to the videographer. And all of us, I think, I mean, oftentimes I'll be careful and say, I know how I felt. Um, I, I think it's safe for me to say, pretty safe to say, that we missed one another. I think that was the human condition for all of us, was we missed getting to be together. I know I did. But it was a reminder that the, the church, the people of God, is not the building, this building. It isn't the rectory. It isn't that little living room space with, uh, with a dog laying in the corner there and me trying to, to give a Norman Rockwell peaceful setting while, while trying to get my boys to do the readings and getting mad that the music wasn't playing when I wanted it to. feels like forever ago in some ways. Yet we were still the body of Christ. We still received and we still shared Jesus' love, then as well as today. We need to, and we get to through our gospel lesson this morning, we need to remember that God is present wherever and whenever two or three are gathered together in God's name. Two or three of anyone. And I'm going to go ahead and include, I know some of us live by ourselves and we have dogs or cats or hamsters or whatever. Two or three. I'm going to say two or three, even if you live completely by yourself without any animals at your side. God, the Holy Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We'll add the Holy Spirit in there. There's your two. God is present, whether we are gathered in this space, whether Jesus' followers in his day were able to go into the temple and access that. What we don't have in front of us in our gospel this morning, so we're at Mark 13, verses 1 through 8. Last Sunday, as I always do, I used the Sunday, uh, the, the propers for the gift of All Saints Sunday. So you didn't get the regular propers last Sunday. We used the readings for All Saints Day last week. If we had had the regular readings for that Sunday, we would have had the widow's mite. And that's a typical spot for it to go in, because as many of us know, we're in the, the pledge stewardship kind of season, right? So the, the people who wrote the Revised Common Lectionary know these kinds of things, and you get the widow's mite. And oftentimes what you hear preached, I'm sure that I've preached it about the widow's might, is, is the gift of her giving her all that she had and, and being all in. And that's, that is one aspect of that story. But that, the other aspect of that story of the widow's might in Mark's gospel is the fact that Jesus was frustrated with the temple system. Jesus was frustrated with the temple system because it was corrupt. Um, there, there were absolute corruptions taking place, and widows were taken advantage of. Um, people who were down on their luck were taken advantage of. It, it wasn't uh, exactly a just and equitable system that they had before them. People were extorted uh, for what they needed for their sacrifices, and it was, it was rather quite ugly at times. Jesus was against that. Jesus was there. He gave them an object lesson saying, look, here's a rich man who gives in some of what he has. Here's a poor widow who gives in everything that she has. And he talks and, and he is, he's against the system at that point. They have that in the 12th chapter, and now Jesus came out of the temple. They get out of that temple setting. And one of the disciples looks at him and says, whoa! Would you look at these arches? Uh, we love them. I do, I do. I love them too. Have you ever stopped to think how in the world they got them here? And there's a bunch of wood put together, and they bent it somewhat, and it sure is pretty. You ever thought about that, Jesus? And Jesus then looks at them and says, do you see these great arches? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. I love the arches. I love the stones. I love it all. 
And Jesus, what we have here in Mark's Gospel is Jesus is reorienting, he is redirecting them. He is, they call this section of Mark's Gospel, the little apocalypse, the, the little revelation of what is yet to come. And this was important in Mark's community because they were experiencing this. Many believe that the, the Gospel writer wrote this during the time when the temple was destroyed. And so Mark's followers, you had, you had people who were solely Jewish. You had people who were Jewish and they were into Jesus, and they were following the way, but they were still partially Jewish. You had Gentiles. You had people who were all in for Jesus. Yeah, all sorts of people. And, and there was great warfare. There were not just rumors of wars, but warfare was happening. It was, it was an ugly time in history. And the disciples do what I would certainly do, and I think what most of us would do. They come, and they say to him, uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew get pulled aside privately, and, and they said, we, we do us this favor. Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Will you give us a heads up? Anyone who has worked with me before on Vestry, a lot of you in here have, um, or in any number of projects, I don't mind. Things happen in the life of a church. I would rather know, though, if there's about to be a bomb dropped at the Vestry meeting, I'd like to know ahead of time that you're going to drop a bomb on me, just so at least I know, like, all right, there's going to be a bomb dropped, and, and I can see it coming, I can't deal with it, but it's coming. I'd like to kind of, you know, like, all right, here it is. Brace a little bit. The disciples in this situation are saying, all right, can you at least give us a sign? Tell us when these things are about to take place. What, what do we need to look for here? He tells them to, to be aware. Jesus invites the disciples, and Jesus includes us in that discipleship to be alert and, and one translation I love is not only to be alert, but to be mindful. Now, sometimes when I think of alertness, I think of panic. When I'm, I'm on high alert, I'm, on high, I'm looking forward, I'm waiting for that to come. Be mindful of God and the people in our midst. Be mindful of how we treat people in our midst. Be mindful of how we speak to one another. Also, really, that we'd never acknowledge it. Be mindful of how we speak to ourselves. Have we stopped for a moment lately to think of what our self-talk is like? treat my children with love and kindness, but do I always treat myself that way in my self-talk? Maybe yes, maybe no. What happens for the disciples is they get anxious and they get fearful because there, there's an uncertain future. There, there's a pretty clear future that there's going to be suffering. Jesus will be part and parcel. Jesus will be present to the disciples and to others in their suffering. But the disciples in that moment when they come out of the temple after that object lesson, the disciples are focused on the wrong thing. They come out and they're, and they're whistling in the dark and say, whoa, look at the stones and look at the building. Isn't it awesome? She's like, well, you missed this. We just went over this. One of the things that I like to practice in my life when it's going okay, you've heard it for many Sunday, I don't know, about five or six months worth rather than the traditional invocation before a sermon uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, and we preach, and we listen, and we engage, hopefully. It's been praying the serenity prayer. It's important to me in my personal life. It's important to me as well in the, in the corporate life of our church together. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. When I pray that prayer, that doesn't mean that this acceptance of the things that I cannot change, that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily happy about them, like injustices that I can't change. Well, that doesn't mean, uh, all right, whatever, I'm going to accept it. No, no. I'm going to be peaceful in the moment about it, though. I'm not going to allow that, whatever that is, to rob me of my personhood, of my belovedness. The courage to change the things I can, that's not saying that it's easy. The courage to change the things I can, mercy. Sometimes there are some things that I need to do, that we need to do, that are really hard, that I don't want to write, that I don't want to say, that I don't want to have to do and the wisdom to know the difference. Those things, those, those little bits of that prayer there, those are the things that can produce serenity. But at the worst moments in my life and in the worst moments in your life, what we do is we go out and we say, look at the building, isn't it beautiful? I know when, when I get anxious about something, I, I shared with, um, with Thursday Eucharist once a month out at Maple Knoll, and I shared with the folks at Maple Knoll this past Thursday that I've been getting ready there isn't anything to get ready for. I've been getting ready to have surgery. How do you get ready for surgery? You do it. Uh, there's a pre-op visit. But I've been in my mind, I've been playing through in mid-January, you're going to get tired of hearing about it, I have foot surgery. There's a lot worse problems in people's lives than having foot surgery, believe me. You know that. Um, 
But one of the things that I've been doing is vacuuming the heck out of that rectory first floor. You have never seen a cleaner first floor of that rectory than when the rector is getting ready to have his first surgery ever. <laughs> and and all, all sorts of little details I used to not care about. All sorts of tucking chairs in and cleaning countertops and just all sorts of little things. My mother-in-law was in town last weekend and um, she was there telling me about all sorts of things in her life. I was cleaning up and just after Mary and Martha, I was Marthaing it. I was doing all the things um, to try and have some semblance of normalcy to, to adjust to what was going to be that I had no control over. Those are moments that when we can pray the serenity prayer. When we don't know what the future looks like, but we know that things aren't as we had hoped they would be, those are moments when we can pray the serenity prayer. Moments when we're in doubt and when we're in confusion and we just don't know the exact way forward. We don't know if the person's going to say yes, if they're going to say no. What can we do about it? Not much. We can pray the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer is key in my life because it reminds me that large stones are going to fall. Big, beautiful stones are going to fall. There's going to be war, warfare, suffering, sickness, illness, surgery, all the things. And God promises to be present with us in those moments, whether we have the heads up or not. What we have is the chance and the choice today to prayerfully choose how we will mindfully respond. So my hope, my earnest prayer for us, is that we can keep our eyes and our hearts and our ears open so that as we communicate with one another, we're communicating God's love. We're giving thanks for the gift of two or three gathered together, and we're not talking about the beautiful arches, but we're talking about the beautiful faith that is instilled within us, shared with us, and shared with those around the world. Amen.